again, welcome. And uh, again, if you're joining us for the first time, we're at uh, the start of the year, as we typically do as every nation. We join with our worldwide family of churches and ministries around some eight plus nations. We had a time of uh, prayer and fasting and a week of consecration that we just finished, and we've just come off a week of feasting. Hopefully, you enjoyed the feasting after your fasting. Uh, and the theme for our fast, as well as the theme for our teaching series next uh, seven over the next uh, few weeks, is this theme of miracles. Let them be known. And we're in the Gospel of John now. Um, when I became a first Christian, one of the first books of the Bible, someone encouraged me to read is the Gospel of John. And if you're new to the Bible, I'd encourage you to start there. Um, it's, it, John writes in a way that's very easy to, to read, but John really presents Jesus. He really puts Jesus front and center in his gospel, and uh, we've seen that in the last couple of weeks through our preaching and teaching, that Jesus really has encountered a variety of type of people. We've seen him at a wedding, uh, turning water into wine, and continues the party, and uh, we see him interacting with Nicodemus, who was a, a senior Jewish leader, had an interaction with him. He moves on and he meets and encounters a Samaritan woman, a shunned and outcast uh, people uh, at that time, and engages with her. And then last week we looked at how he engages a Roman uh, official, a Roman official. And so what we just gather just briefly from those encounters is that Jesus really comes for everyone, and everyone has need of Jesus, whether you're in a prominent place in society or you're forgotten by society. And we're going to continue on. And we're going to be in John chapter 5 today. But before we get there, um, it says miracles, let them be known. And so we're a church that really does believe that God still performs and works miracles today. And so um, the purpose of miracles obviously is to, in the, in, in, it's an intervention in human affairs. But one of the major purposes, at least for John, of the miracles, of these signs, these seven miraculous signs that Jesus performs, is that we would get to know Jesus better, let him be known. And in getting to know Jesus better, we more fully trust Him. And by trusting in Him and having a relationship with Him, we'd experience the life that He has for every single one of us. I don't just come up with that. John tells us that right at the end of his gospel. He says it like this in John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so John believes that this Jesus that he's telling you and me about is alive and real and can change your life, can change your circumstances. And so today, join me in John chapter 5 as we discover some more about Jesus through a real uh, miraculous encounter that you're going to come to see. Um, it's the healing of a paralytic man. And so it's a long passage, and so I'm going to do something a little bit different today. Is I'm going to break it up. And so we're going to read a few verses, we're going to speak a little bit about those verses, and we're going to continue, kind of immerse ourselves in the story, if you will, and just see what parallels it has for our lives. But there's really two parts to this message that I want to come across. So the first part is this, that Jesus comes to all of us, to you, to me, to us, with grace. Jesus comes to us with grace. So join me, we're going to read the first five verses of John chapter 5. It says it like this. In the ESV, at this, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been in, an invalid for 38 years. Now, just off the bat, there's a lot of detail, a lot of geographic and archaeological detail there. And John does this, and a lot of scripture does this, to, to let you know that this is not fairy tale stuff. This historically happened in geographical regions of the world that we still can visit today. And the archaeological detail tells us that we can trust that this person, Jesus, walked this earth and did some incredible things and had some incredible claims. And so we see that Jesus now comes back to Jerusalem. We, we'd seen him, he'd been in Galilee uh, before this, kind of where he grew up, his own neck of the woods. But he now goes back to arguably the center of the world for the Jewish people, at least in his time. And instead of going to all the prominent places he could have gone to in Jerusalem, he heads to this place called the Pool of Bethesda. Now Bethesda means house of mercy, kind of rather fitting for Jesus to go there. But... What John describes the scene, well, actually, I have a little model picture of what this might look like. And so you can see that 
those, that pool had been filled with water, and John paints a, a rather desperate, a rather disparaging picture for us, that around these pools, around this particular pool, are many, many people who are sick, invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. And so I want you just for a minute there to imagine the sight. Um, imagine the sounds. Imagine the smell. A lot of these people can't get themselves to a bathroom. Um, really shunned by society, really outcast. I want you to imagine that. I want you, we can kind of just read this in a nice, comfortable 21st century air conditioned room. That's not what Jesus is walking into. But Jesus walks straight to this place to be with these kind of people. And so, why are they there? Now, a hundred bonus points if you read in your Bible and you saw that verse 3 went from verse 3 to verse 5. There's no verse 4 in your modern Bibles, right? What happened there? Was it a printing error? And so in verse 4, in some older translations tell us that there was a legend, a superstitious religious legend at the time, that the people are there because at some stage the angel would come and would stir up the water. And when that water was stirred up, oops, if you got in there first, you would be healed. That was the legend. Now, do we know if this was actually happening? I don't know. But it was taken out of your Bibles and mine because it doesn't appear in the original text. But certainly that's the explanation. In fact, as we go on in the story, you'll see that that's why these people are here. I mean, how desperate is that? Now, I don't think that that's true because how cruel of God would it be? It's like, oh, one person, you win the jackpot, the rest of you try again next time. So I don't know if that really communicates the character and heart of God. Nonetheless, they believe this enough to be you know, dozens, hundreds maybe of these people just desperate to get into that water when it gets stirred. And that tells us about one particular man. Because Jesus came, he sees this one particular man. And he's been sick for 38 years. Now, some of you are not even alive for 38 years. I'm just alive more than 38 years. I've over 38 years. But it's a long time. It was a really long time then when the average life expectancy in that time of Jesus was around 35. You were living a good life, you got to 40. And so, obviously, modern technology has extended our lifespan. But this man has been, it's probably all he's ever known. Do we, was he born like that from birth? It doesn't tell us, but it's been the majority of his life, for sure. Now, we can look at this, and we can also see that this pool represents some kind of hope. I mean, it's a desperate hope, but it's some kind of hope for these people. And if we draw back, there's some symbolism there. All of us are besides a pool of Bethesda. Yours might be a little bit more sophisticated than that. It might be called the pool of career, mm. the pool, pool of financial stability, mm. the pool of success. But the pool of Bethesda represents something that you and I place our hope in to get wholeness, mm. become well, find fulfillment and healing in life. And so John dramatically is going to contrast this with the person of Jesus and bring an indictment on all our religious superstitions and the impotency of these other things to truly bring about the healing, the wholeness, and the transformation that we desperately need and Jesus offers us. All right, so remember John, what's his purpose? He wants us to come to know and believe in Jesus and trust him and through that have his life. So let's continue on in the story of verse 6. It says, when Jesus saw him, this man lying there, and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Now it says that Jesus saw him and knew him. How did he know his circumstances? Well, um, much like sometimes you and I today can get supernatural knowledge. If you've ever been in some kind of prophetic ministry or prophetic presbytery, we know that God sometimes can give people supernatural knowledge of a situation. They didn't know that about you, but reveal something, not to embarrass you, but to hopefully, I've experienced that in my life, we've experienced that incredibly uh, in our lives. And so Jesus is a human, but he relies on the same Holy Spirit that you and I rely on, okay? And so we can estimate that he's getting some supernatural knowledge about this man's condition and his plight. And so it says there, what do we learn about Jesus? We see some incredible compassion. Jesus sees us and knows us. For some of you, that's a comforting thought. Maybe somebody's like, that's a little bit discomforting. But he sees you fully and knows you deeply. He knows you. Such that if he called your name, it'd be kind of like, you know, remember when your mom called your name? And it just was different to any other person calling your name? 
It's like your mom just knew you, and maybe in that moment she knew what you had done, even though she hadn't seen it. She just had some supernatural mom knowledge. Do you remember that? Or was it just me? Um, and it's kind of like if Jesus called your name, it, in an instant you would just know that this person knew everything there is to know about you. Everything there is to know about you. Your past, your present, your future, your hopes, your dreams, your fears, your failures, your insecurities. Everything in a moment. Jesus sees us and knows us. It's kind of like one of my favorite songs, Psalms 139. David talks about how God, he talks about how God, you know, when I sit down, and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and I lie down. And I'm acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, before a Lord, you know it all together. So again, I don't know if that brings you comfort or some discomfort. You know, God knows everything there is to know about you. You can't fool God, so don't try. He knows our thoughts, our motives, our intentions, our heart. He sees us and knows us and moves towards us. And moves towards this man. Do you know that compassion is single-handedly the most dominant emotion uh, the Gospels tell, tell us about Jesus in his ministry? Over again, you'll read in your Bible, my Bible, and compassion moved Jesus towards people. He was moved with compassion. It's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a word like in the original. It's like the, he was shaken in his innards. Okay, it's like a bit gross, but it, it's it's a it's a violent, um, just emotion of compassion and empathy for the state of people. And Jesus was moved with compassion uh, towards us, towards this man. Jesus is moved with compassion towards you, your suffering, your situation, your plight. Maybe you don't feel that existentially. Maybe you feel God's done everything but that. God's ignored you, overlooked you. But that's not the case, and it's certainly not the case of what Scripture tells us. And then he asked this man a very peculiar question to ask of a sick person, particularly someone who's been sick for 38 years. Do you want to be healed? Or I like in another translation, do you want to get well? Why do you think Jesus would ask this? Surely this man would want to get well. Surely that's why he's there, by that pool. Why would Jesus ask this? We can speculate. John doesn't tell us specifically, but we can speculate a couple of things. There's probably a few things going on here. Firstly, Jesus is very personal. He wants to have a conversation with this person. He wants to dignify and humanize this man. He's probably been ignored or treated as an outcast or less than for the full 38 years, maybe more, of his life. But he's also asking a question. Jesus asks us questions. What? To draw something out of us that he already knows. And so he's drawing something out of the heart of this man. What his hope is, what his fear is, where he's at. And here's the reality. Maybe not in this man's case, but you'll know this well enough. Common sense will tell you that not everyone actually wants to get better. Because to get better means to change. And not everyone wants to change. You know, for some of these people, sickness had become such a core part of their identity. For them to think otherwise would, 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 would shake them. Some of them, their livelihood and living is because of their sickness. They depend upon the, the empathy and compassion of others. And so he comes and do you want to get well? Do you want to change? Do you really want to change? Your life is going to look very different after this moment. And it's a question we must consider. Do you really want Jesus to change you? Because he'll do a proper, thorough job. And so he comes to us and asks us the same question. Do you really want to get well? You know, want to is a, is a, is a question of desire, isn't it? We're, we're human beings are propelled by desire. Uh, want to precedes how to, Right? Now, if you go into your favorite bookstore, you go into a bookstore, or if you go into your favorite online bookstore, there's a whole massive, it seems every year it grows and grows and grows, the, the self-help section, right? The how-to books. And if you browse there, I mean, it's how-to on everything. How to invest, how to get into cryptocurrency, how to become your best version of yourself, you know, whatever, how to make your own clothes, how to live on one dollar for the rest of your life. I don't know what it is out there, but there's some crazy stuff there. And it's really interesting. You can look at all that, right? And you can grab a whole bunch of things that could improve your life. But what's important is not just the how-tos. Do you want to? 
learn how to live on one dollar for a start. Do you want to make your own clothes? Do you want to learn about investing and the risk of reward and all that thing? Maybe another example is imagine you came up to me very excitedly after this sermon about we're in the coffee bar, having a conversation, you say, look, Richard, I want to show you, I want, I want to give you the rundown of how you can become vegan. And I have a meal plan for you. I've got a shopping list for you. Um, I'm going to show you step by step how to become vegan in seven days. And we're going to have so much fun with this. Where it's going to change your life. And in fact, here are all the health benefits. And you rattle off all the health benefits. And here is how it's helping conserve the planet. And it's, it's, it's protecting animals. And you run it all off. And you're just thorough. And you're excited. You're passionate. But the one thing you're missing out, what is it? I want to become vegan? The answer is categorically no. <laughs> want to always precedes how to. Do you want to be well? Do you want Jesus to change you? Do you want Jesus to change your marriage, how you parent? Because it's going to require something of you. Do you want him to do the things he wants to do in your life? Let's continue on the story. Verse 7. What does the man answer? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed. And he took up his bed and walked. Now, that's amazing. What just happened there, right? Well, let's quickly look at his response. I mean, it kind of is an awkward response, right? Do you want to get well? Do you want to be healed? It's kind of like a yes or no answer, right? Do you know in the exam paper, you just love those yes or no multiple choice answers? But it was the open-ended question, like, oh my gosh, you could have to write more than one word. And it really is a yes or no answer to Jesus. But what does he do? And it really gives us... Again, the question gives us insight. The answer gives us into where he's at. I mean, this guy, one, he shows an element of ignorance. He doesn't know who's standing before him. And maybe we can forgive him for that. Like, maybe he never hadn't heard of Jesus, hadn't heard of his miraculous working power. Maybe he's super cynical because people have come along and maybe they've said, hey, do you want to get well? We'll take you to the pool. And then there was a joke or whatever. I, we don't know, but this man clearly is ignorant. He doesn't know the power that's standing before him to make it well. Also, he's helpless. No one can help me. How am I supposed to get the pool? And then thirdly, he's still looking at the pool to heal him. So he has a hope or a misplaced hope. And then that answer is really kind of covers many of our answers. Some of us are ignorant. Some of us are ignorant as the, the, the healing and miracle working power of Jesus. Some of us are skeptical about Jesus. Some of us are still figuring out, is this Jesus the real deal? Like he had some pretty uh, crazy claims. Maybe he was a good teacher, but the Son of God is not a bit of a stretch. And some of us are, are just are helpless. You know, sometimes when you've been battling with something, a sickness, an addiction, a pattern of behavior, sometimes it's easier to make peace with it, right? Even though you might hate it in your life, it's easier to kind of surrender to it. And some, a lot of people are just like, this is how life is going to be. And again, I can't fault the man. 38 years, this is how life is going to be. And so some of us will help us. And so we, the thought of even changing or being different or having a different experience doesn't even cross our minds. And then lastly, all of us have misplaced hope. We hope in things that will ultimately let us down. And this man brings hope in this legend of this stirring of the water to bring about change in his life. But Jesus, if he wants to get well. And I just, I just got to love Jesus because he could have just like, okay, well, you don't know who I am. Like, that's not a very faithful answer. And I really want to tell you this because there is zero faith in this man to be healed. And now some of you have come from a, 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 a teachings of Christianity where it's all about if you just have enough faith, if you just trust God enough faith, why didn't you get the answer? Because you didn't have faith. Why are you sick? Because you didn't have faith. And I want to tell you that faith is important. Gosh, I would see, we would see a lot more stuff happen if we actually just believe God a little bit more, right? Can we agree upon that? But can we also agree there is no faith in this man? There is no merit, there's no virtue, there's no righteousness in his character, or at least John doesn't say anything like that, that says, oh, Jesus is endeared towards this man's faith, his righteousness, nothing. This is just an act of sheer grace to a man who's in desperate need, who doesn't even really know who is standing before him. 
Can that encourage you that maybe you're faithless, but Jesus still comes to you with grace? Jesus still comes to you, and our faith will be important in your journey, and we'll see this in this man's journey. I'm not discounting faith. I just want to tell you, some of you need to be healed from healing. It wasn't because you'd had enough faith. And that's not the heart of God, I don't think. And so he heals this man in an instant. So not only do we see Jesus' compassion, we see his tremendous power. He speaks a word, and this man begins to feel something different in his body that he hasn't felt in 38 years. He gets up. He walks. Jesus said, oh, by the way, take up your mat, which is going to be really interesting as the story progresses. I love what Tim Keller says about miracles. He says, Jesus' miracles are not just a challenge to our minds, but a promise to our hearts. That the world we all want is coming. Now, isn't that really what Jesus came? He came to give us, you know, like those movies, you get a trailer, you get a little a little glimpse of what the movie is about, and there's some trailers that pretty much you watch the movie if you watch the trailer. Uh, yeah. But I can kind of pretty much see what that movie is about. And this is what Jesus came, with his mission is to give us a glimpse of what ultimately he's going to do. That in the world that he longs for, that he originally created, that's gone terribly wrong, that he's coming to restore, there is no sickness. There's no blame, lame. There's no blind. There's no paralyzed. There's no bitterness. There's no shortage. There's no economic inequality, there's no injustice, there's no destroying of God's creational ecological disasters, there's none of that. That's what he's coming to, and he gives us a glimpse in this moment. And that's what our hearts long for, our hearts long for a world that's full of that beauty, that justice. And so as the story continues, we see that God sees us, sees you, knows you, and is moved with compassion towards you, so much so that he comes to you with grace. Do you want to get love? Do you want to get better? The second part now moves in, not only does Jesus come to us with grace, but he comes to us with truth. Now, the second part of verse 9 is kind of funny. It says, now that day was the Sabbath. I mean, that's great. That's good to know that that day was the Sabbath. But actually, for John, the whole tension of the story hinges upon this. That this wasn't just a miraculous feeling, it was, but it was significant because it happened on a significant day, the Sabbath. Now, um, assuming some of you maybe have no idea what the Sabbath is, let's talk about the Sabbath. Sabbath was a Saturday, right, in Jewish custom and tradition, it was based upon the fifth commandment. That says you'll work six days, but then the seventh day you're not to work, okay, isn't that a good God right there? Don't work, all right, six days you can work, one day don't work. Why? Stop working. Rest. Your body needs rest. Your mind needs rest. Your soul needs replenishment. That's my gift to you. Don't. Just enjoy. Just enjoy your family, your friends. You know, cook some good food. Just enjoy that. And so much so that was a great commandment. But by Jesus' time, the Jewish nation and the leaders had gotten so serious about keeping that promise that they had come up with so many laws and bylaws and categories of what constitutes work. There were 39 classes of work with hundreds of bylaws saying what you could and couldn't do on the Sabbath because their original intention was to take this seriously. But by the time of Jesus, it became an incredible burden. It was complicated. It was confusing. And if you broke one of those commands, you could be stoned to death. The, the physical stoning, not the other stoning. <laughs> right? Now, you've got to, got to clarify that in this day and age of... <laughs> weed consumption. <laughs> and so one of the laws was the prohibition of, of carrying anything from one place to the other, like a rolled up mat. Now, you might think that this is archaic. Uh, this is actually still today. Many years ago, or about 20 plus years ago, I was an undergrad student at the University of Cape Town. And um, how many students you enjoy group work? It's the worst, right? <laughs> you gotta, you got to work with people. People are just the pit sometimes. Right? <laughs> Why don't they all think and work like me? Um, and I remember one girl, she was in a group, and she was Jewish, and was a practicing Jew. And uh, it was really hard to find out when. So we actually, the only time we could work was on a Saturday. It was the Sabbath, it was Shabbat for her. And uh, we actually were at a place, but, but she couldn't do a lot of things. She couldn't turn on the computer, she couldn't turn on the light switch. She had to do all that kind of stuff for her. This is 20 years ago. Um, 25 years ago, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
here, right now, in this city, if you go to certain parts of our city and you go into condos, they'll have what's called a Sabbath elevator. Shabbat elevator, right? Some of you in those condos, some of you see them on your heads. What is that elevator? It's an elevator designed for people on the Sabbath not to be able to push buttons, not to do work. And so again, you can look at that and say, that's ridiculous. This is people who want to take seriously God's word, right? So that's not, I mean, sometimes we give the, the Pharisees a hard time, but their hearts initially were in the right place. They just went horribly wrong and distorted. That's what legalism will do, is we kind of take what God says and we just want to add a bunch of stuff to it, right? Live holy. Yeah, so you can't listen to this music. You can't watch these things. You can't go, you can't hang out with these people. It's like, <laughs> did that say this? No, that was, that was man-made stuff that doesn't bring freedom, it brings bondage. Um, a commentator on this passage says it about the significance of Jesus healing on the Sabbath. It was not Jesus' usual procedure to seek our people to heal. Rather, they came to him over, and that's the predominant thing, people came to him. There was one exception to this rule, when healing was undertaken on the Sabbath. Both the synoptics and the Gospel of John stress that Jesus deliberately sought out opportunities to heal on the Sabbath. Now, some of you like this aspect about Jesus, because it's kind of like he's wanting to provoke people. And some of you like to provoke people. I want to get up in your business. And he's getting up in the religious authorities' business. Why? Because he loves them. Grace comes to them. But he has to do it in a different way, to expose their hearts, to expose the distortion that's taken place. You think you're loving God, you're not loving God. And I'm here to help you see, I'm here to bring truth and confront you with truth. And I'm going to offend you if it means it'll get your attention. And so Jesus does that. He intentionally provokes and exposes the man-made rules and interpretations of their day that blinded and distorted people to the heart of God's word, his word, uh, work, and his ways. So let's continue on. Verse 10, it says this. So the Jews said to the man, so the Jewish authorities said to the man who had been healed, I mean, who had been healed, I mean, hey, okay, like it's 38 years this guy has not been able to walk. He's not walking. Perhaps he's well known around the town, right? Like, He's been healed. So what are they going to say to him? This is amazing. Let's have a party. It's a feast already. Let's just make the feast even better. It's the Sabbath. <laughs> it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Can you see how the distortion has taken place? The heart of God. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. Now, we don't know the motive of this man's heart. But he's kind of in a predicament, because like death by stoning, right? You, you, you're like, ah, it was him. <laughs> it, was me. It, was, it was him. He healed me. And so they asked him, who's the man who said to you? Because there's nothing worse. There's something worse than a law break, and somebody else telling people to break the law. So who is this guy? Who is this guy that's telling you to pick up your mat for something so horrendous on the Sabbath? Now, this is amazing to me. Now, the man who had been healed did not know who it was. Had no, he had no idea who healed him. But Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. And it's interesting, and we can look at that as maybe a little rabbit trail. Why, you know, the, this, the pool of Bethesda, there was tons of people that were sick. But why did Jesus withdraw? And maybe one of the reasons is Jesus didn't really come to have a, a miracle sideshow. Hey, I'm here. Let's get everyone healed. He, he, had a, he had a purpose and a focus. And he knew that the more he did miracles, the more it was going to increase uh, the time towards the ultimate the, his death. He had some stuff to do, and his ultimate purpose wasn't just to get a whole bunch of people physically healed, but to heal the world. He comforted just one lame man. He came for all of us who are lame and paralyzed and blinded in our sin. Mm -hmm. And so he slips away so much so that the man doesn't even know who healed him. What a contrast to how Jesus responds to this man and how religious legalism responds to this man. And be careful of that. And for all of us, we look at the Pharisees, and we're more like the Pharisees than sometimes we like to admit, especially for us who have been Christians for a long time. So easy to slip in legalism. So easy to add things, add conditions to, to God. So why? Because we love God, and we want to preserve the holiness of God. So we add stuff that sometimes may not be the heart of God and may actually detract and draw people away from God. And so we've got to be careful of that. And so Jesus comes again to this man, verse 14, to 
says, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See your well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. What? So what's going on there? Um, so Jesus comes again to the man. So Jesus comes in grace. Do you want to get well? And I want to heal him and touch you. Like, we like that Jesus, right? Jesus, come wave your magic wand and make my marriage. Boom. I'm good. Make, make me well. Boom. I'm up my financial hole. Boom. I got the answer to my prayer. And that's awesome. I think Jesus does do that. Jesus can do things like that. And it's, most, it's the exception on the rule. I'm still point that out. As incredible as healing miracles are and do take place, they really are the exception than the rule. Do we want to see more? Absolutely. It's hunger for that. But just know that it's the exception rather than the rule. But we all want that Jesus just to snap the finger and it's done. It's great. But Jesus is more interested in so much more than that. He wants to go to the fundamental need of our relationship with God. And he comes not only with grace, but he comes with the truth. Now, we don't know the specifics of what's going on, but Jesus does. And so there's obviously some sin in this man's life. Now, Jesus may seem to allude that there's a causation here between his sin and his sickness. Now, we've got to tread very carefully here, okay? Because it appears like this, in this instant, there may be some connection. But we are not Jesus, and so be incredibly careful to make that connection as you look at other people in your own life. Where does sin, suffering, and sickness, where does suffering and, and, and pain come from? Well, at least four places. Number one, we live in a fallen world. This world is broken. It doesn't function like it should. And so just right there, you're going to experience pain, you're going to experience suffering, you're going to experience hardship in your life. It's not your fault, it's not that person's fault. It's just how it is in a fallen world. Now Jesus is doing something about that, and we get to join him in that, and we can be the hands and feet of Jesus and help bring about situations of uh, justice where there's injustice, of healing and mercy where that's needed. But we need to acknowledge we live in a fallen world. First place. Second place is others' actions. People do stupid things, and it hurts you. A blind person drives, a, 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 a drunk person drives drunk, and they mow down a family. That's a, a stupid action on that person, and now impacts on other people. In your own life, if you're married any length of time, you'll know this, right? Other people's actions, or other people's sin, cause us suffering and pain. It's the second category. The third category is you. You cause yourself pain, right? You're not perfect. You're not flawless. You sometimes make bad choices, right? Yes, and it causes you pain. And we're so quick to deflect it and point it to everywhere else, including God. But sometimes we don't. Like, I'm part of this fallen world system. I, too, am also fallen. Don't make right decisions. And I hurt people, and I hurt things. Maybe I don't intend to, or I see it afterwards, and I have a choice to make it right. That's the third place that pain and suffering comes into our lives. And then fourthly, we don't talk about this, particularly in the Western context, but the divine. There's a whole realm of, um, of evil, personified evil, that is against God and against God's people. Now, I think it's something around 20% of the healings that Jesus performed in the Gospels also involves some kind of uh, deliverance, divine deliverance. And so it's significant to say that sometimes there is demonic influence in our lives that causes us pain and our suffering. And so there are many ways that we can have pain and suffering in our lives. So no wonder your life is hard, right? No wonder life is hard. Yeah, that's a lot to take in. And it's in those moments it's easy to lose sight of a good, gracious, and powerful God, kind of like what we were saying this morning. But this, this man, Jesus comes to this man, and he comes again to this man because his grace and his truth is again coming to this man. You know, he was healed by an act of sheer grace. He's been given a new life in every which way that you look at it. This man has been given a new life. And now Jesus said, hey, I celebrate that. Now in light of that, in light of what you've done, hey, go and sin no more. Change your life. Don't, uh, don't go back to the life that you once had. Don't go back to the sin or whatever it was in this. We don't know the specifics. But don't go back. Move forward. Move ahead. That's what transformation is about. And so Jesus comes to him and says, and puts an obligation on him. And says, hey, that, that act of grace, that changed you, that's amazing. I rejoice with you. Now it obliges you to live in a different way. It obliges you not to live in light of that. And so some of us like the Jesus of grace. And some of us like the Jesus of truth. But we need the Jesus of grace and 
truth. Otherwise, we cheapen that grace, and it's not really grace. Um, and so Jesus comes to him and tells him some, some strong truth. Let's go on, verse 15, and we're going to end off here. It says, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. Now, we don't know his motive. Some people think he's malicious, right? he's outing Jesus. Um, again, we don't know his motive. Um, at, at worst, it's malicious. At best, it's just stupid. <laughs> it's just dumb, right? Because now, you know, this puts a target on Jesus back. In fact, it says, and this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, this is verse 18, but he was even calling God his own father, making him equal with God. In other words, Jesus was clearly identifying himself with God. Some of us think, well, Jesus never really, Jesus was a great teacher, a great prophet, an incredible activist, we should be more like Jesus, turn the other cheek, that's, that's all that good stuff, but Jesus being God, no, that's what we've told, you know, that's what we put on Jesus, he never claimed that. Like, it's, it can't be more clear in this, we just read that Jesus provoked the religious authorities by saying, my father's working, I'm working. You know that the father doesn't take it, he's working on the Sabbath, and so if he's working, I'm working. And that's what got him in trouble. That's what got him to the cross, is that he claims to be God. And there was, that was blasphemy to the Jewish authorities. They couldn't see that he truly was God in the flesh standing before him. And so many people today struggle with that truth as well. Many people like the idea of Jesus being a healer, like the idea of Jesus being gracious, like the idea of Jesus kind of fixing the problem that's in my life, but now telling me how to live, telling me how to, to walk out life, that's, that's a little bit of a stretch, right? And so God comes to us with grace, and he also comes to us with truth, and both are needed to make us fully well. There's more at stake than just this physical man's healing. God wants to transform him at the core of who he is. And it's the same with you and I. He wants to transform us at the core of who we are. Now, grace and truth are distinct, but they're inseparable. Right? It's not really grace if there's no truth. It's not really truth if there's no grace in it. Um, John 1.14 tells us that Jesus came from the Father and he was full of grace and truth. It tells us he was full of grace and truth. Not grace on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we get truth. Not like half grace, half truth, 80% truth, 20% grace, full grace, full truth. Guess what he wants in us? Full grace, full truth. He wants us to be a people full of grace and truth as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Now, some of you are grace people. You like the idea of God being kind. You love this story, at least the first half of the story. God's forgiving, he comes to the, the outcasts, he shuns the religious leaders, I love that. He's understanding, but he doesn't place demands on this man, just get up and walk, or live your life, live your best life, here we go, you go on your way, I love you, you know, peace, all the shalom, all the thing, you know, slips out the audience, doesn't want to be seen, like, we love that, God is love, we love God is love. And all that's true, but it's not the full truth. Uh, you tend to resist God's truth. Some of you are truth people. You like the idea of God confronting, getting up in the religious authority's face. You like the idea of justice. You like the idea of things being black and white. Who's in and who's out. God is righteous. Right? You like that, and you tend to resist God's grace. And we need both. Without the other, both have their dangers and distortions, right? It's not grace or truth. It's not grace, then truth. It's not truth, then grace. It's grace and truth. So we desperately need grace in our lives. You desperately need grace in your life. I desperately need grace in my life. We desperately need to hear Jesus' words to us. Do you want to be well? That's grace coming to you. Maybe you didn't earn it. Maybe your life's a mess. Maybe your marriage is a mess. 
Maybe you regret. Maybe you have 38 years of regret. But it's still not too late for you, for me. Doesn't matter how lame you've been in your life, how blind or paralyzed you've been in your life, it doesn't matter. Do you want to be well? That's Jesus' gracious offer to you and I today. But we also need truth. You need to hear truth. I need to hear truth. We all need to hear Jesus' word. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Live in light of grace. Live in light of the gracious gift that God has given us in Jesus. Let grace empower and transform us to live a life that aligns with truth. We need grace. We need truth. We need Jesus. And in Jesus we have fullness of grace and fullness of truth. I want to invite us to pray and come before God. We're going to go back in song of worship. But I want us to just respond to Him in this moment. And so Father, we are incredibly grateful that you are a God full of grace and full of truth and we see that in Jesus. Lord, even in this story, we're the man. We're the man at the, at the pool of Bethesda. Lord, we might have a different name for it. We might be looking for some kind of different miracle. We might be putting our hope in something to make our lives better. But all that falls short of us might be Jesus. And so just like you came to this man graciously, you saw him, you knew him, you see us, you know us. And it doesn't put you off us, in fact it draws you towards us. That we are objects of your grace, we are objects of your compassion. And so may hearts that are desperate for grace today just receive your grace. Just receive your love and your grace, that you know us, you know our thoughts from afar. You know our past. You know our present, you know our future, you know our regrets, our bad mistakes, our stupid mistakes. And you come to us graciously. But Lord, we're so thankful that you love us enough to also not just leave us there, but you give us the truth of how to live in a way that brings us freedom in all aspects of our lives, that really puts us on a path of transformation. That your grace empowers us to go and sin no more. And may hearts that need to hear that today, Lord, have received that. Hearts that don't cheapen your grace, but take your grace and become trophy. Our lives become trophies of your grace that speak the fullness of your grace and truth. And then lastly, Lord, may we be a church community. Oh God, would you protect us from legalistic religion that would put unnecessary burdens on people? God, your truth is a burden enough. Your truth is offensive enough. And so may we just beat down those paths to get people to see you, Jesus. So make us a community full of grace and full of truth so that people would encounter the true love of God. Would you do that by your power, by your spirit, in your name we pray. Amen.